Hey there, folks, Rel here. Welcome back to another episode of the Untitled TTRPG podcast. If you clicked on this episode, it means that you know that we're going to be talking about AI. And, uh, and you're consenting to a civil discussion that you may or may not agree with. The topic of AI within the TTRPG space in particular is very divisive. Uh, people kind of seem to vocally view it as a very black and white topic. But I think that we, well, if you don't agree, please feel free to leave those in the comment section down below. But I think that we can agree on AI is not going away. We, as a you know, human society, are marching inevitably toward technological progress, exponentially toward technological progress, and AI is a part of that future. With that being the case, that doesn't mean that we have to uh, and just accept uh, how that's going to play out, and we'll, we'll talk a lot about um, kind of shaping that discussion throughout this episode. But the reason that this episode is timely is because the uh, CEO of Hasbro, Chris Cox, is that his name, gave some talking points regarding AI during a Goldman Sachs event. And Christian Hoffer was the one to uh, post this news in an article on EN World on September 10. And, uh, and some, some fun quotables have, have come out of it. The, the one that I'm super uh, fascinated by is that... Uh, he says, I play with probably 30 or 40 people regularly in regards to D&D. Uh, there is not a single person who doesn't use AI somehow for either campaign development or character development or story ideas. That's a clear signal that we need to be embracing it. Uh, John, your thoughts. Um, <clears throat> so wh where do you want to start with that first statement? Um, because there's a few different places we can kind of dig in. So I take it, let the wind take you where it where Okay, it so I know apparently there's been discussion about 30 to 40 people. Where does he have the time? Um, and it's actually a little coincidental that this is what we're talking about this week. Um, the Eldritch Lorecast from Ghostfire Gaming just posted their episode, and it was actually, there was a segment about the same topic. One of the things that Dale... One of the things Dale Kingsmail said um, was just that you kind of have to like like backwards compatibility. 30 to 40 people regularly might mean something different to different people. So, for example, if he's playing a lot of one shots where they aren't regular campaigns, it is plausible that he could be playing with 30 to 40 people regularly. And even regular like to me, regular play means at least once a month. For some tables, it means if I'm not playing at least twice a week, then I'm not playing regularly. So I think it kind of, a lot of this stuff is kind of up in the air. Um, in terms of backstory development, again, I think it comes to the circle that you run in. So uh, if you are the CEO of a major company, the circle you're running in is going to be different than you and I. Um we tend to be creatives first. I'm not saying Chris Cox isn't. Um, I'm just saying that like we get excited about coming up with our own stories and not having, uh, and we have the time to come up with our own stories. So I, I, I see this statement as plausible. I think it would be mistaken to say that it is representative of the TTRPG hobby as a whole. So that's where, that's what I glean from this too, is that, Regardless of who or how many people he's communicating with, playing games with, whatever, that's that's fine. At Thirty to forty people actually does seem reasonable if you have that type of um, availability. Which I, I don't know. I can't speak to his schedule, but um, given how much money he makes, I'm sure he can make the time. Uh, the the clear signal that we need to be embracing is the part that I take umbrage with, and like you said, it's not representative of everyone but there's so the the tech industry just all around is very interested in the future of ai it is essential that uh, they start investigating the possibilities of how to make use of it what the cost of making use of it is how the uh the audience or just the the people of the world 
or react to it so that they can get ahead of uh, any sort of regulation or uh, limitations that might be incurred because of those things. There's also a, it's, it's not insidious necessarily, but there is such a thing as kind of like beating you over the head with the same topic over and over so that you become apathetic to it. And so when we see, you know, multiple controversies about Wizards of the Coast regarding AI, while it may seem like a really crazy, awful thing right out the gate, over time, you will very likely become more numb to it unless you're part of the, the exceptional handful of people who, who are really invested in, um, in that conversation. Uh, very much the same way in politics, too. You can keep repeating the same lies, same stories, and eventually people are going to be like, okay, it's just whatever we're going to talk about. Like We, we just take it for granted um, as if it's just a common occurrence. And that is how you shape an industry uh, over time is by the continued proliferation of, uh, or I, I guess um, the continued like surfacing uh, of that topic idea to the masses so that change can be incurred. And then also so that you can temper that change. So when people say like, no AI use in, you know, in whatever product, you, you might get part of what you want. Like no AI use that isn't labeled which is where a lot of the regulation is happening now. It is centered around identification and clarification that something is an AI uh, generated topic or something that's been you know, contorted by AI to make look and you know, outside of the original work. And uh, that's as far as we've gotten, basically. Yeah, so just one um, consideration, because um, I'm not sure if I necessarily agree with this, um, but I thought it was an interesting point that Sean Merwin brought up in that same segment, which is that statement that this is something we should be embracing. There's a possibility that it's not Chris Cox's actual view, even though he's the one that said it. Um, it may have been a statement based on the context of the event he was in in order to make investor bankers happy. Um, because as CEO of a publicly traded company, he has a fiduciary responsibility to make that company money. And there is, according to Sean Merwin, there's a good chance that had he said like, you know, boo, AI is terrible and we'll never use it, that Hasbro stock would be like immediately impacted by that. That being said, I know Chris Cox has mentioned AI in the past, even um, before like the OGL debacle around that time, he was talking about possibly using AI um, for dungeon mastering, which I think is interesting because we just got Baldur's Gate 3, which it, it isn't playing combat with enemies controlled by an AI. Isn't that AI dungeon mastering in a way? <laughs> right. So but, let's, let's yeah. not pretend that there isn't a use case for, for AI. So I even see, so like solo... Uh, TTRPGs is where my where my head goes. You know, if you are somebody who is very insular or just doesn't doesn't have enough uh, time to to spend, you know, among a reliable crowd of folks who are going to play games with you, that I mean, there's plenty of options where you know AI doesn't even come to the the equation. However, it can also be like a a really fun freeform tool. Like if you're using ChatGPT and kind of trying to walk through some ideas a lot of times um and when it comes to limitations of of ai it, it feels like things are very one note you have to give it a lot of uh nudging to even get a response out of it that you actually that is actually valid so i don't think we're even at the point where ai dungeon mastering uh can feel uh can feel hands off like i i don't think so there's a lot of um concern right now about we can we can use large language uh, models, you know, coupled with machine learning, uh, as it relates to viewing the the uh, the catalog of adventures that exist within D and D, uh, and then that could help produce new adventures, and uh, and that's legit. I also think that you're always going to need the human element, and uh, just to speak from my personal experience, and this is going to this is going to change over time. AI is always going to get better, but there might be like the cost might not even be worth attempting. It's at some point. 
Uh, but anyway, so I, I tried to create an adventure start to finish, just a very lo like low level introductory one using uh, chat GPT, walked through it, um, gave it like prompts and said like, okay, what would happen in this situation? Okay, what, what do you think that the players would do in these situations? And what I got back was, to me, it wasn't useful. I had to rewrite like 95% of the whole thing. And that's just from like a, it trying to write itself based on, on prompts. So there's a human component because the intention, intention of like why you're asking questions is something that is contextual. And while I, I think you can get to the point where you're, you're faking that, you're, you're making some really convincing, uh, I, I do believe that you can make it a convincing adventure with, with AI, especially given if it's trained on uh, wizard stuff. But at the same time, I feel like we'll notice. I feel like uh, we, we will devalue uh, the adventures by virtue of them not being produced by a human. Because so much of our own perspective, our cultivated experience, just as an individual, like when you're writing something, can't be replicated. Because when you when you see like something that doesn't quite line up, or you think might be more interesting if it's this other thing over here, it it usually comes from the lens that you you know you've had a like an experience when you're younger, or you've had a conversation in a hallway somewhere, and and that makes uh, that surfaces just in your writing because it's relevant. Some things may not be relevant. Some things might be from, from memory years and years ago. Sometimes some things might be like a desire that you have to just in the moment because you've been watching some, your favorite show or whatever. And that kind of just gets subtly integrated into your writing style. So I, I don't think that the human component will ever be erased. And I think that we will get to the point where either AI adventures are, are going to be labeled as such you know, as is written, um, not by humans, or we'll get to the point where we're just like, they, they're just not good enough. I could be wrong. But when it comes to creative work, I don't think that's the place for it. So just rereading Chris Cox's statement toward the end, um, I, and I could be wrong, but it sounds like he's there's lots of ways that you can use AI and it sounds more like he's advocating for user generated content as opposed to officially created content, which there, there is a difference there, you know, um, you know, it's, it's different to say, here's an adventure product that we are selling you that we created using AI versus here's a, a generation tool. You can use it. I mean, one way to think about it is like distal is a good example of one of the things I love most about distal is the tables, right? So you have tables that can randomly help you generate a backstory. Um, what's the difference between rolling on a table and writing it out versus an AI basically randomizing it for you and then kicking it to you? The, the difference is just what you said, which is the human element. So AI could be the starting place that gets you thinking, but it's not going to do the beginning, middle and end in a, artistically satisfying way. So yeah, I, I definitely think that there are ways that AI has been being used in a way to help users generate content. Now, when it comes to the cost, uh, probably the most compelling counter argument I've heard uh, was first came to my attention from James Hayek, who also reiterated this in the latest episode of the Eldritch Lorecast, which is the environmental cost. Like the actual energy cost of running AI models like chat GBT is incredibly harmful to the environment. And if you remove that costly component, the, the ethical conversation is different. But I do think that, you know, when, when we say AI is here to stay, um, we really seriously need to look at that energy cost and the environmental impact that running these AI models has. Uh, speaking of regulations, we, we've mostly been gearing this conversation toward the potential of like text-based uh, AI use. Though the, the bigger, I guess, sticking point is when it comes to art. And we've seen this numerous times where, uh, you know, some AI-generated art slips through either in, you know, Big Beast Glory to Giants uh, or, um, or even the witch hunting that occurs because AI art exists and people are like trying to identify it 
you know, Taron Pounds uh, talked about this before, you know, he, he called something out as being AI community glommed onto it. And uh, it very much was not AI. And but at the same time, it triggered a, a whole response from like wizard saying like, hey, it's not, it's not that, you know, we, we already verified it. And also look at this dude's all of his stuff that he's been doing for years and years. It is the same art style. Just as a and question, then, was that the whole fighter thing where they yes. thought the fighter in the PHB was AI art? Okay. Yes, it was. And um, and Taryn gave an apology, says like, whoa, my bad. I'm, I'm not, like that. I should not have done that, which is how, how you deliver an apology. There's no caveats in there. It's just like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so so good on him for for doing that. Um, but there is there is that mentality where we're trying to find like, oh, is it? You know, what corners are you cutting to deliver us a product? Um, and who are you hurting in the process? And so when I think about art, it's to me, there's two sides of the coin. First is that like, there's this argument that if you have AI art, you can eliminate artists. And if you go to ArtStation, um, you know, I guess within the past uh, year, you'll see a lot of like no AI art logos. It's like there's a riot within the site. And because of that, uh, websites like Kara.app, which uh, is like, it's a different, um, imagine like Twitter merged with ArtStation. That's the kind of feel. And it's strictly no AI. And uh, and that was spurred because of the, because of our ArtStation not taking a hard enough stance quickly enough. So there's definitely a, a concern ethically about taking AI art, uh, you know, learned off of other people's art styles and uh, and then trying to sell it and like pass it off as a new product. And that's where a lot of the, the regulation is going to come in. However, we as a community have a nasty uh, sort of knee-jerk reaction whenever we think that something could be AI art or, or when people use AI art. So look at um, a lot of the various uh, small YouTube channels out there. Look at their thumbnails. I've done this in the past, um, early on, just like generated something that I thought was topical for AI. Um, Distal's way, way, way early days were using like AI generated stuff just to give some sort of visual representation. Because if you're not doing that, then the the alternative is a cost investment where you have to shell out for somebody to do art for you, which should be the natural uh, progression for just full disclosure, distal, totally uh, human generated art. And um, I'm, you know, $10,000 plus into it already. Um, but that point being, it's it's costly to, to do that sort of thing. So if I were a, if I didn't get the support from, uh, from the community that I did to help fund this, uh, my project, the alternative would be to either uh, do less of a game, not do a game, or, or do something totally different. Um, none of those things I, I wanted to do because I feel like that there is value in what I'm trying to create. So uh, this, this sort of like negativity where you kind of lambast people for using AI art, it's, it, it is to the point where it's unhealthy um, in a lot of ways. You should be directing that, my, my personal take, you should be directing that ire at uh, the folks who who actually deserve it, being the the CEOs of the world, who very likely, if they had the opportunity, would just stop hiring people to do art, if if it came down to it. But the small creators, like no, it's the, there's an ethical probably dilemma there. It's just like okay, well that's you know technically probably somebody else's art, but I, I think you have to to weigh the harm. I guess the the potential for harm against the response that you're issuing. Uh, which is a nuance that a lot of people don't or can't uh, embrace. We're very much like, okay, AI art can't be bad. You know, human, expensive human art, good, good, <laughs> you know, over here. So something to consider. Yeah, I, I think it's contextual too. Um, so just to come back to Chris Cox's statement that kicked this all off, right at the beginning, I texted you this before we started recording, um, just... One of the things he started with is uh, inside of development, we've already been using AI. It's mostly machine learning based AI or proprietary AI, as opposed to a chat GBT approach. And 
the thing I was questioning is like, well, what's the difference? <laughs> like, and that was one of the things that to go back to Sean Merwin's thing, it could just be that Chris Cox is trying to use buzzwords to make himself sound more in the circle than like necessarily gung ho about it. Um, but looking it up, chat GBT is a machine learning based approach. So when you're saying like, it's this, not this, like to me, it was like, what's the difference? Because according to Google's AI search, um, <laughs> it's the same thing. Uh, now there is well, a difference so to between, speak on that real yeah. quick. Um, when, when proprietary enters the conversation, it's a, uh, it's creating your own model. So for example, Amazon has their, their own model. Um, actually there's a, there's a number of, uh, various models, uh, for that, that aren't chat GPT. So uh, maybe that's the distinction that he's trying to create. Like instead of using something that's widely created, he's using something more, um, handcrafted bespoke to, to the company so that what it produces as a result is different than what you would get from something like chat GPT. Right. And that that is like so ChatGBT is an open source platform, whereas uh, something proprietary from a Google search is something that's closed off. It's like specific to whatever company created the model. Um, and I do think that especially in the art conversation, the, the ethical dilemma isn't just the fact that you're not paying artists, but the fact that a lot of the models that are commonly used are stealing other artists work. And I do think that the ethics and the witch hunt will shift if say um, D and D pays a bunch of creators for their art and somewhere in the agreement or contract, it says your art that you make for us will be put into a model that is proprietary that we own that uh, we will use for say the new VTT um, like sigil. And that will allow uh, players or users to generate um, AI uh, portraits for their characters. I, I, and you're you're paying for that service too, going into it. I'm sure. So I think that if there's an if if the agreement is clear, I can see where the the ethics of it might soften. Um, the I, I really do think that the witch hunt is a combination of supporting artists, but also uh, people know that artists' work is being stolen. So that's really to me that's like where we're at right now. Um, right. And again to speak to it, we're not, we're not resigned to just like whatever happens with AI happens. Um, but we, we are thinking in terms of regulation with the understanding that it's not going away. Yeah. The perspective will, will shift over time. I mean, if you're watching this right now, if you play D and D, uh, how did you create your, your token for the VTT? Uh, did you just, you know, steal an image off you know, online and, um, and then just use it? Point being, this is a, a pain point that exists, and um, and it's not for commercial use. You're not selling it, right? But you've still taken somebody's work. Uh, what about a YouTube video? You ever um, pull pull some images off of a of a website, maybe like D and D Beyond or something, paste them into to your YouTube video, and then not credit the artist. Well, okay. My one thing with that is Wizards <laughs> does have a fan policy that says you are allowed to use our art for these specific uses, and sure. there have been definitely times i've made a token in a D, &D game with a, a google image based thing um right. i do i do think that the the difference is that uh, a lot of times the art is credited in the back corner um of whatever game i run uh and well that's you yeah it's also <laughs> um it also it's it's the environmental cost thing it comes back to that um like i if, if somebody drew a picture of a tabaxi and threw it up on like a, some a place where it could be Google searched, <laughs> like that's a little different than you know the energy cost of running the model. At least I think. Again, uh, okay. I'm not I'm not uh, super educated on this topic. Um, but okay, so as as so so what you could do is uh, so a anytime that you're you're s okay very technical. Anytime that you're uh, making a call to the LLM large language model, you, uh, you ask it to, to come up with something based on, on the input that you've given it. Right. And then it, it figures that out based on the, the wealth of knowledge that it has and then delivers something that hopefully meets, uh, your, your specifications. However, 
I think that over time, the cost of these things could become less uh, less costly because, so this is, this is my take, where you could uh, basically index like the most common responses. Like if, if you have like a thousand people who are saying like, okay, uh, orc with two and attacks and and essentially, like whenever you send that up to the LLM, it's always going to kick back the same thing. Like if that's a very popular question or input to to give, it doesn't need to do. Uh, it doesn't need to incur that cost of of generating it all from scratch again. It can simply uh, cache you know some of that information and then just kick it back to you because that's the one that you want. So I, I think there are uh, technological, I guess, uh, efficiencies you can create and will will likely occur because. Because it's costing the companies to uh, for for this as well. Like it's not just an environmental cost. Like every time that you put something in and say like, okay, this is what I want, that's generating a cost for them. Uh, it's it's fractions of of pennies. But point being, sorry, the game no, game designer, um, okay. yeah, games industry tangent. No, I think that that's exactly what people kind of want to hear. Um, cause that's part of why if, if let's look at the word witch hunt for a second, the reason there's a witch hunt is because people don't understand witches. <laughs> so they want to hunt them because it is unknown. So the more people understand what's inside the black box, the easier it's going to be to have informed ethical conversations about it. Um, like, I didn't know that, but it, like the metaphor I think of um, is I, I had a science teacher once and I don't know how related this is, but he's like, you know, when when cars first started coming out, the, the horse and buggy industry was very upset about it. Um, right. And of course, if you think about the development of automobiles, like they got more efficient as time went on, like the, the some of them were not very gas efficient until kind of recently. So and then even then there's still like problems that we have yet to solve when it comes to like like the batteries of electric cars and stuff um and how we can safely dispose them so it's we're constantly facing this but that doesn't mean it's not worth us keeping our thumb on the pulse of yeah in line with that um it's very easy for us to look at like what exists now as being this is this is all there ever will be but things change and in particular, I think that they're so I, I, I am not of the stance that uh, AI doesn't have a place in TTRPGs. I, ha- I think it has a specific place in TTRPGs. Um, however, I'm also of the stance that if you uh, if you give an inch, they'll take a mile, they being the, the larger corporations of the world. So as it relates to you know, D&D or whatever, uh, it, it really, if there's enough investor interest that's going to push you to to make a decision or you know change some of the 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 moral high ground that you had had shared via you know a wizard's faq saying like oh now we're not going to do ai generation we're always like on the up and up and we're going to try to be as transparent as possible that can change there's nothing saying that it can't uh however what can also change is that as ai becomes more prevalent becomes more just integrated into all the tools that we use uh, becomes more difficult to discern the uh, the true nature of. You will create an industry, like a smaller niche industry, for human-created products. This is already occurring, and it will continue to. Just like organic produce or, you know, whatever, um, uh, obstacle course racing, you know, instead of you like McDonald's is great. And also, I love this thing over here. I like, you know, the, the gourmet uh, food. These sorts of industries spring up because there is a niche, because there is a demand. And I don't think that we'll ever get to the point where we are so mired in our complacency that it will be the only option available. So to that end, uh, hopefully you can sleep a little bit better at night. If this video has been interesting, helpful or entertaining, please feel free to like, subscribe, tell your friends about the channel. And also, if you have thoughts on AI as it relates to what we have now, what it will be in the future, feel free to leave those in the comment section down below. I know that this is a very tricky topic and uh, it will continue to evolve as we get more regulation, you know, just as time passes 
and as our stance on things change. So uh, what you see today may not be what you see tomorrow. And I'm not even going to generate thumbnail of this with AI. I'm going to do it by hand. Wouldn't right. that be ironic? <laughs> yeah, I thought about it. I was like, this might be the one time <laughs> where it makes sense. But uh, but no, I'm not going to because I don't need to. I'm going to draw stick figures instead. Maybe. I don't know. We'll see. Thanks very much, folks. We're all signing off.